At Winona, near Gulgong in the central west of New South Wales, they're sowing oats into perennial pasture. And even before they harvest a single head, they'll have saved up to $500 a hectare. It's called conservation farming, and it'll yield a district average of two and a half tonnes per hectare without an ounce of fertiliser or pesticides or herbicides. Far more profitable since we've headed down this track, mainly because our inputs are so, so much lower. Uh, our inputs are so much lower because we're starting to cycle nutrients a lot better, uh, definitely increasing, increasing carbon levels, increasing soil microbial health. It just goes on and on. Um, uh, I, in, in, in other words, we're really farming more or at least closer to how it was originally designed in a natural sense. Colin Size runs Winona with his son Nick. Like many farms, their 840 hectares of mostly granite soils were addicted to inputs, and by the 1970s, they were in a spiral of increasing costs and lower productivity. It took a night of drinking with his neighbour Daryl Clough for Colin Size to break that cycle and try something radically different. The pasture crubbing idea, quite seriously, came out of a night uh, when Cluffy and I had quite a few beers and uh, we just thought that we, we should have been able to have sown crops into native grasses when those grasses were dormant. And certainly, because that was in 1993, it was such a lunatic idea, you, you would have to be drunk to think of something so stupid. Far from stupid, it started a quiet revolution. Weeds have virtually disappeared on Winona. Its flock of 4,000 merinos graze on about 50 native grass species, some of which have reappeared after more than 50 years. Soil microbes are thriving and insect diversity has increased by 25%. All of that in a drought. And in an age where greenhouse gas emissions and offsets could define the future of agriculture, soil carbon levels have increased by about 4%. We've done an audit here um, on this place and we are sequestering about 7,000 tonne uh, over the whole property um, and we are emitting about 2,000 tonnes, so we're in credit for 5,000 tonne. Further down the central west catchment near Gulma, Wool growers Louisa and Michael Kiley are trying to shepherd in a new era of carbon farming in Australia. They've formed a lobby group called the Carbon Coalition and have transformed their own 720 hectares into a carbon farm. When you get carbon back into your soils, you increase its water holding capacity, you increase its uh, productivity. So we like to farm for carbon in our soils because when we farm for carbon in our soils, we increase not just uh, our stock capacity, but also our ability to hold uh, water and drought proof the property. The Kylies have replaced synthetic inputs with microbial enriched biological sprays. But the biggest change to their soil has come from just keeping it covered. The analogy is similar to a vegetable garden. Why do you put mulch on a vegetable garden? We put mulch on our paddocks all the time, never bare earth. Bare earth kills microbes, uh, uh, goes towards erosion and, uh, and, uh, and is very unproductive. So we cover our soils all the time with litter litter from our pastures, litter that is left over from our grazing operation. That carbon farming is the way to regenerate uh, farmlands and to stop the degradation of our agriculture. The Carbon Coalition organised a conference late last year at Orange in New South Wales to push for soil carbon to be recognised as an offset in greenhouse gas emissions trading. How do you get a message to a farmer? And the answer to that question is on a cheque. So, uh, and we say it also gets the farmers out of the need to, say, believe in climate change. You don't need to believe in climate change if you believe in a market. And it's a very similar market to any other market. You choose to grow a cow, you choose to grow wool. In this instance, you will choose to grow a crop called soil carbon. In the United States, the Chicago Climate Exchange 
has been trading soil carbon since 2005, but it's still not recognised as an official offset under the Kyoto Protocol rules. The momentum for change is building though. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation and an international coalition of conservation farmers are now pushing for the rules to be changed at the Copenhagen Climate Conference next December. Because now it's an international issue. How are we going to feed and the extra billions of people that, that are coming on and how are we going to mitigate against climate change? The only real answer is in the soils. The government wants its Australian Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme up and running next year. It won't include agriculture or its potential emissions, but already the voluntary emissions market is looking closely at soil carbon. What we're trying to do is to link emitters of carbon with people who are capturing it. Uh, the whole concept of, of uh, emissions is built on net emissions, which means that the net amount that we emit over what we capture, well, we're on the capture side. Prime Carbon is registered with the Australian Stock Exchange and is telling the market that improved land management practices such as minimum tillage cropping can help boost soil carbon levels by up to 1% in two years. The company is offering landholders up to $400 per hectare for carbon stored on behalf of its clients. It says a new draft standard for the voluntary market managed by the Department of Climate Change, will be released later this year. It's expected to include soil carbon removal units, the first step towards recognising this sort of offset in a full market context. So how do you measure the carbon storage? That's a very good question because um, uh, there, there are several parts to that. Firstly, we measure um, by uh, measuring soil samples, taking soil samples in an approved mechanism and sending them to a laboratory and testing what was there when we started. We then um, overlay a set of management practices and a, and a period of time and we measure what's there at the end. And the differential carbon is what's sold as a carbon credit. But importantly, we're not just measuring what is stored as carbon, we're measuring a change of practice on the land as well. In New South Wales, the Department of Environment and Climate Change has been monitoring and evaluating soils across the state for the last year. Its early results confirm that carbon levels can be improved through better land management. Where we have found better carbon levels is where farmers adopt management practices like conservation tillage, conservation farming, stubble retention, minimum tillage and direct drilling type practices and also where the pasture management practices involve you know much reduced grazing pressures and time control grazing and, and better grazing practices so they seem to lift the carbon levels. But whether that can be transformed into a credible, accurate system of measurement for a commercial market is the big question. Yeah, it's a good one. Look, if you gave me a sample of soil in your hand, I could take it to the lab and measure the carbon content very accurately. That's, that's not an issue. The issue is I take, if you like, one gram or two grams of that sample, put it in a machine and get an accurate number. But how representative is that of the 100 hectare paddock that, we're, that we're, we're trying to make a decision on. How representative is that 100 hectare paddock of, of the community of farmers in that region? Um, that's where we really come in, into strife. It's as if anything is lining up pretty much in a straight line, that's telling us there's a good relationship between what we've measured and what we're predicting through this technique. Dr Jeff Baldock is the CSIRO's chief soil scientist. He told the Carbon Farming Conference there was still a gap between the science and the expectation for a national soil carbon market. We know that soils, that, that particular soils will hold more carbon than others. For example, a soil that has more clay in it could hold more carbon than a soil that, has, that is dominated by sand. So the sand plains of WA will probably not hold as much carbon as the self-mulching black verticels of, of the Darling Downs. But I guess once we, if we can come up with, with an understanding of, of how much carbon we could get in there, then we'll know where we're at and whether we should be targeting higher values. The CSIRO is taking the lead role in $20 million of research recently announced by the Commonwealth Government 
into the factors which influence soil carbon and how it can be measured. Keys are to, to make sure we understand how much carbon different cropping, pasture, agricultural systems actually return to the soil. Um, how that varies spatially so that if we're going to go out and take a sample and we take it from position A, how does that number then relate to the whole of the paddock? How many samples do we need to take to get those kind of numbers? And then uh, the other side, I suppose, is our, we, we, we tend to use modeling scenarios to predict where carbon might go. If we can make those better, it'll give people confidence to enter into carbon markets. OK, I'm lining you up, John. You have to go to the right. Dr Brian Murphy says what's needed is a measurement model which steps outside of the 25-metre grid now standardised by soil scientists. To the right, John. But there's also an opportunity to harness decades of data yep. already collected by many farmers about their local conditions. And we need to know a bit about the climate, about the different soil types, about the different landforms within a paddock. So a lot of the things which, to some extent, farmers already do when they try and make some fertiliser, look for fertiliser recommendations and sample for fertiliser recommendations, some of those um, protocols are probably you know, useful in, in trying to get protocols for measuring soil carbon at the paddock scale. So this is um, one of your better paddocks, is it? Yes, Probably. yes, we've uh, taken this from where we've been able to get uh, a lot of good animal mm. impact. Working with their local land care group, the Kylies know they're improving soil health and building carbon. Their carbon coalition is pushing for the government's new research to be collaborative, on farm and urgent. I can see bacteria. We have got carbon farmers who have increased their soil carbon. They understand how to do it. They've made a lot of the mistakes, a lot of the questions. They've done it just by the trial and error method and innovation. Scientists need to come and look at those ways and the, sci and the farmers need to get more scientific about some of the anecdotal evidence that's coming through. So there is no time for uh, research that goes into uh, laboratories and a five-year cycle. Stern gave us 10 years to do something about climate change nearly two years ago. We need collaborative on-farm real-time research to make the changes that we can make to climate change in the time that we've got.